Um, I don't speak that often to groups like this, so I've actually written out my remarks so that I would you know, manage to get in everything that I wanted to say. So I'll start by thanking uh, the Global Media Research Institute and John for inviting me to speak with you about what I do as a research director on documentary films and what I've learned in the process of doing this for those many years, as John just said. So um, to begin, I'm going to share with you some uh, personal uh, visual memories that illustrate the way that memories can be inextricably intertwined with the images that fix and reinforce them over the years. In the archival community, there has been a growing interest recently in the collection, preservation, and reuse of home movies and amateur films, typically those shot in small gauge formats, and more recently in uh, video. The content of home movies is typically family life, and especially such family events as birthdays, graduations, weddings, and family trips. Uh, home movie makers are often unselfconscious auteurs motivated simultaneously by the diversity and otherness of the world and a desire to capture and preserve it. For the subject of a home movie, revisiting these moments on film is something of a Proustian endeavor, flickering, graining film, film frames fire up synaptic connections to memories of things past. I like to think of that as an analogous thing that happens when historical archival footage is effectively used in documentary films. So let's see, here we go. Okay. And I'm gonna talk through this first one since it's silent. My father shot this film, this 8 millimeter film, in the early 1960s when we lived in Liberia for two years. West Africa was an almost unbelievable adventure for our sheltered family from upstate New York. Overall, the 50 or 60 rolls of, of 8 millimeter footage he filmed during those years reveal his great amazement at the variety of tropical color, pageantry, and otherness all around us. In this clip, my father films us attending the opening of a new palace for the president of Liberia. An exorbitant sum of money had been spent to construct an enormous palace by the sea for the Liberian president, that uh, one, uh, William V.S. Tubman, and dignitaries from all over had arrived to celebrate its opening. Uh, okay, that was okay. Sorry, I, <laughs> talking too much, showing too little. Um, <laughs> Anyway, even at 10 years old, I was aware that there was something wrong with this picture. The great majority of Liberians that I observed live without benefit of running water, electricity, or an elementary school education. So living this experience and then reliving it periodically through watching our home movies was perhaps the very beginning of my interest in history, images, and what they tell us about the world. So when John asked me to speak on dilemmas of principle and practice, I thought, Initially, it was a nice, straightforward way to illustrate a discussion of the issues involved. But as I began to think more about it, I realized that I was going to have to define these principles of the use of archival footage. Because in the real world of being a professional visual researcher, the question of principles is more often relegated to the background as the exigencies of production dictate prioritizing more practical concerns. So, and nor, nor did I, or most of my colleagues, become a researcher through a course or program of studies on the subject, but rather through practice. So I began to wonder whether indeed there was a commonly accepted set of principles that could be articulated by those of us in the production community. So towards this end, I conducted an informal survey of some of my colleagues around the country who are visual researchers, documentary producers, and librarians in moving image collections. So, I'll start by offering a quick definition of what I mean by archival footage and by documentaries. Archival footage is any footage acquired for use in a production that has not been created by the production itself. Therefore, archival footage encompasses everything from conventional historical moving image clips to stock footage. Historical can mean anything from the beginning of the film era to earlier this morning. It includes footage originally filmed for narrative, news, or documentation purposes even amateur or home movies. Stock footage is footage filmed specifically for commercial purposes, and even stock footage can be historical as major motion picture studios and other large commercial producers 
used to keep libraries of stock shots on hand for their productions, and now that footage itself is used sometimes for its historical purposes. Because archival footage has not been created by the producer who now intends to put it in her production, archival footage is by definition either owned by someone else or in the public domain by virtue of one of a number of circumstances. Thus, issues of intellectual property are almost always involved. Documentary film is an expanding genre that encompasses many subgenres, and for each subgenre, archival footage may be used to varying uh, degrees and effects, so different principles are prioritized and different practices pertain. Nearly every subgenre of documentary practice, with the exception of pure cinema verite, makes some use of archival footage. The compilation film is a genre that gained prominence with the critical success of The Atomic Cafe, a 1982 release black comedy about the development of the atomic bomb and Cold War culture. The success of this film, its irony, its uncovering and repurposing of primary documents, paved the way for many structurally similar films with different content. A more contemporary film such as The Corporation follows in Atomic Cafe's footsteps. The compilation film privileges historic footage and period documents above any other representation. Many films in this genre also include contemporary talking head interviews such as Ken Burns' Baseball, Rick Burns' New York, a documentary film, or Rob Epstein's The Celluloid Closet. I'm going to skip one here because I don't have this on my DVD. <laughs> um, the portrait film is another documentary subgenre that can sometimes be a, a very taste style documentary with minimal, if any, historical scenes added. Some examples of this would be David Van Taylor's A Perfect Candidate or Barbara Koppel's Wild Man Blues about uh, Woody Allen. Or it can equally be an American Masters style portrait such as Scorsese's recent No Direction Home biopic of Bob Dylan with its extensive reliance on archival footage. The essay film is a documentary genre that is polemical and prioritizes the persuasive aspects of narrative. An essay documentary may or may not rely on the use of archival footage although many films in this category do use archival footage extensively. The evidentiary nature of archival footage is often important in this kind of film, and some recent examples are Darwin's Nightmare and other essay-type films would be films by Chris Marker or maybe Michael Moore might fall into that category. So I'm going to show a short clip from a film that's an example of the past two categories, which is the portrait film and the essay film. The overall film that this clip is going to come from was an episode of PBS Frontline series, The Millennial Pope, about Pope John Paul II, and that uh, aired around 1998. And so the overall film, of course, would be a portrait or biopic. But the section that I'm going to show um, kind of falls into what I think of more as the persuasive, persuasive essay mode. Um, and I think this clip sort of shows how different kinds of footage can be used in creative and powerful way to make an argument. So. Sorry.
fighting against God all the time. We, who must choose between evil and good, try to imagine the life of a man who So nearly every category of documentary, as I've gone through, makes use of archival footage in some of its particular manifestations. And I think that's because history has become a really important subject for us. Well, you know, I don't think it is. If, if I leave it on this screen, then I can go right to the next thing. And if I change it from here, I've got to start it up. Well, let's see. If it, if it, if it runs away, tell me about it. Um, Okay, so um, as I was saying, the even Hollywood films now often are using um, historical footage. I just saw trailers for The Queen and Bobby, um, and both of those appear would appear to use historical footage extensively, at least at least in their opening. Um, furthermore, as the subject matter of many contemporary films has become the media itself and the mediation of reality. Many recent films seem to prioritize archival footage and even to make it their subject, such as films like Out Fox, which probably all, many of you have probably seen. Um, in fact, one of the producers that I work with recently told me that he frequently gets calls from, from young producers asking about how to shoot an interview or to set up a location shoot because all their prior experience has been with found or archival footage. So, um, so now for the, the principles. <laughs> Most filmmakers, I think, would agree that the co most common use of archival footage is to establish a time and a place or the reality of a past event. To quote Desmond Bell, a Canadian filmmaker, the available stockpile of images is used as a narrative resource capable of releasing the submerged voices of history and of attending to their story. Hence, a primary principle that I and most of the people who I spoke with for this uh, presentation identifies a principle that references the a kind of authenticity of the image or a historical truth relative to the new context in which the image is being used. This is not always a simple calculation. One of my respondents, documentarian David Van Taylor, said, the eternal question is how far can you stretch a piece of footage? Another colleague, a fellow researcher, spoke about the creative manipulation of archival footage and the viewer's sense of the legitimacy of this manipulation being in direct proportion to the sympathy or lack thereof with the point of view of the film. At some deeper level, however, a general principle exists pertaining to an editorial honesty about the time and place of a filmed image or the veracity regarding the event. It is generally agreed that if the narration or other form of contextual commentary refers to, say, an Italian city being destroyed by bombing during World War II, that it would be inappropriate to show images of Dresden. Of course, there are films where narrative context permits a looser or more impressionistic use of footage. Principles of authenticity and veracity come into play, especially when archival footage is used in an evidentiary manner to document or to prove the occurrence of an event. It is, we believe, an editorial obligation to use the existing footage in a way that acknowledges the limits of the point of view of a single camera or even multiple cameras in view of multifaceted reality. As an archives researcher and the one who has the initial responsibility of discovering the coverage of a particular event and selecting relevant scenes for the editor, I am most aware of the limitations of archival footage to cover the reality of event in any complete sense. And yet news and information documentaries are constantly serving up archival footage as a seamless recreation of events. Um, a good example of this was the brouhaha that arose over the ways in which various films made in the 2004 presidential campaign used the footage that John Kerry shot on his swift boat in Vietnam. Um, so in that sense, you know, a, a film theory argument essentially became a political argument or vice versa, a political argument became a film theory argument. Um, I'm gonna show a short clip from this uh, a John Kerry film called Going Up River, The Long War of John Kerry that I worked on. Um, it was released about a month before the election and it uses some of the contentious footage um, that was being argued about by all the pro and con swift boat veterans.
They started sending us in the rivers, and uh, we went on raids out of these rivers with orders to fire on huts and, and any target of opportunity in order to prove to the Viet Cong that they didn't own the rivers. Another common convention um, in archival footage usage is a kind of montage that I call a historical journey montage, which is a sequence constructed for the purpose of backgrounding the story in a particular history, and often presented as a very general and objective history, if you will. For example, uh, on a recent uh, film that I was working on, the producer told me that the the story was a very contemporary story about some women in, Russian, in a Russian prison. But they felt that people wouldn't understand the, the story well enough unless they gave them a background about Russian history. So in order to see Russian women in a prison in 2003, they asked me to find footage that they could cut into, let's say, a one-minute montage that would take the audience from the czar through uh, you know, the show trials, through the perestroika that they could show in like one minute, which would you know, go by like that, and everyone would instantly have a you know, much better understanding of Russian history. And this happens a lot, I mean, I'm sure. I, I tried to find a good example, and I have something to show you, which is a little bit of an example, um, but pro probably not the best one, but something I could come up with. And so I'll, I'll show you that now. This is the uh, a very beginning of a documentary series that ABC News did in, uh, it was a little before the millennium, but it was clearly setting up, you know, the sort of look back at history for the millennium. And it was a 10-hour series that's, needless to say, spanned the decade of the 20th century as it was ending. And uh, so there's a sequence at the beginning of it that's a little bit like what I've just described, and which I think is, uh, we'll show you a little bit what I mean. The second principle of archival footage use is an understanding of the intellectual property issues. 
For the past few years, the production community along the rest of the world has been extremely concerned with issues of intellectual property. Extension of the terms of the copyright laws has enclosed more creative material for longer periods of time, while at the same time technology has created tools that enable the reproduction and distribution of more and more material. The rise of documentary to prominence in the entertainment industry has caused copyright holders to raise the fees they charge for the licensed use of materials that they own. Quite a few of the people I spoke with in my little survey absolutely prioritize these copyright issues as a principle of archival footage use in documentaries. As previously stated, archival footage by definition either belongs to a copyright holder or is in the public domain. And as anyone following issues of of intellectual property recently is aware, the public domain has been shrinking. This puts a financial burden on many productions that require extensive use of historical material to tell their story. As some recent documentary films ha have garnered previously unheard of success at the box office, you know, think Fahrenheit 9-11 or Super Size Me or you know, Wing Migration or the Penguin movie, whatever it was called, March of the Penguin. Um, so, Copyright holders um, who base their licensing fees on the extent and the term of distribution have raised their rates, thinking any film is a potential you know, Fahrenheit 9-11, as far as they're concerned. Producers also encounter hidden expenses in the use of archival footage in researching and clearing underlying rights and permissions for certain kinds of archival footage, such as music, talent, trademarks, and logos. But I think here that the, it's important, the principle really is the understanding of copyright and the fair use clause and the definition and importance of the public domain. A third principle could be called the integrity of the frame. This principle argues for the preservation of the image as it was originally framed when used within a new production. For instance, if the archival footage in question were filmed in the 1960s in a 16 millimeter in a standard four to three aspect ratio, it should not be squeezed or cropped to suit a 2006 16 to 9 HDTV television broadcast. This principle obtains in direct proportion to the importance of an original aesthetic intent of the footage. The recent uh, broadcast of the Rick Burns four hour documentary on Andy Warhol occasioned a very spirited discussion on a list that I'm on by archivists and filmmakers who were very upset about the way that Warhol's films and screen tests were cropped to accommodate the 16 by 9 PBS standard aspect ratio. So this principle comes into play as footage of artists and filmmakers is increasingly used and recontextualized in documentary films. Um, okay. So in practice, I find the principle of the authenticity of images is well understood and respected within the production community. It is generally acknowledged that historical accuracy was a lot looser back in the day. So if you see documentaries that were maybe made in the 1960s about World War II, you might see a lot of looseness about exactly what was, you know, if they say one thing about Europe, you might see various lack, things that aren't quite specifically what you're supposed to be looking at. But now I'd say that, especially in public television and independent documentaries, people really adhere to a strict accuracy. And, and if they can't, they let you know that they're not. At the same time, however, production funding is much, much tighter than it used to be. And one of the first budget lines to be reduced is the research line. And while this is always regretted, I think it's, it's sanctioned because media seems to be much more generally available than it once was. Producers and editors think nothing of considering Netflix to be a giant archive or helping themselves to the riches of YouTube, never mind that they don't know anything more about where the footage came from than a, a URL. Budget cuts and vast image availability have created a situation where the producers will often crib scenes from already completed productions. Um, so and this was a very common theme um, and complaint amongst people who I spoke to for my survey. They feel that, that this practice um, means a loss to the documentary vocabulary by the overuse of certain images. And that's primarily due to the fact that people don't have enough money to spend for researchers to go out there and delve into archives and find material that's fresh and new and hasn't been seen before. So <clears throat> as a result, more money and time is spent um, 
not so much on researching original material, but on finding out where, you know, sourcing material, finding out where it came from, licensing it. Okay. Another practical consideration, and this was brought um, into the discussion by a colleague of mine who's a, an archivist at the NBC News Archives, is a frustration um, with producers who feel that everything that was ever broadcast or produced exists somewhere in an archive and can be just plucked off the shelf. <laughs> so she wanted me to tell everyone, not everything that was broadcast exists now as a recorded copy. And even if you can find a reference to it in a catalog or online or at the Library of Congress or whatever, you may not be able to find it you know, in an existing copy that survives to this day. Um, so anyone who's studied film history knows that you know, much of the early production of motion picture industry is gone. I think they say that 50% of the silent films that were ever produced um, have deteriorated or been lost or in warehouse fires and things like that. Likewise, a very high percentage of local television news output, which is really only material from, say, the mid-1950s, um, has been uh, lost for a number of reasons. Much of it was discarded um, the, because the stations felt that they didn't have uh, storage space, for instance, or they didn't have people to accession them and catalog the material, and also because they just didn't understand that there would be any interest or value in this material. And uh, recently I was uh, researching for a program, in fact, that's on tonight, at least, I don't know, it's on New York tonight. It's uh, an American experience about the history of in vitro fertilization. And I was talking to a local news station in Richmond, Virginia, who told me that sadly they didn't have their footage because it had been donated to a local college for editing practice. So things, you hear these kinds of stories all the time when you're digging into uh, archives and um, they're sad, but they're true. <laughs> so, um, okay, so in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property issues, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's kind of been a perfect storm of the confluence of privatization, copyright extension, and the commercial success of some documentaries um, all coming together to make a very difficult situation. Um, I feel that there's a general trend in our culture towards the privatization of many things that used to be public, whether it's corporate sponsorship of public media, public space, private concessions on public lands or charter schools, and that's eroded the public sense of entitlement to that which by custom and by law has been designated a public good or a public right. And in spite of the intrepidity of the creative community, filmmakers are, have been affected by this trend. Um, there are two centers that are working on this. The Center for Social Media at American University and the Duke Law School Center have both published recent um, documents that I can quote at the end, but um, they're working to educate and advocate for solutions to this problem of privatization as, insofar as it concerns uh, footage and, and corporate media. Um, the Center for Social Media at American University, along with five documentary associations, has published the Documentary Filmmaker's Statement of Best Practices and Fair Use. The statement is necessitated by the fact that documentary filmmakers have found themselves over the last decade increasingly constrained by the demands to clear rights for copyrighted materials and the knowledge and perspective that documentary and documentarians can provide are compromised by their need, by their need to select only the material the copyright holders approve and make available at reasonable prices. Okay. So I have here, um, in terms of, as I'm sure most of you know, that our Constitution gives the Congress the power to enact copyright legislation. And that cop and the, co the Constitution copyright clause says, that it is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. However, over time, the courts have interpreted the copyright law to mean that the ultimate purpose of copyrights is to encourage the production of creative works for the public benefit 
and that therefore the interests of the public are primary over the interests of the author when the two conflict. And these rulings have since been formalized into fair use laws and decisions. The Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 extended copyright terms in the United States by 20 years. This effectively froze the advancement date of the public domain in the United States for works covered by older fixed copyright terms. So um, just a little bit of a definition of how, what fair use is and how it works. Um, the practice of fair use um, is a key, as this document said, a key part of the social bargain at the heart of copyright law in which as a society we concede certain limited individual property rights to ensure the benefits of creativity to a living culture. However, the practice of fair use, and fair use is simply using material that is licensed or owned by a copyright holder without getting their permission or paying their fee to use it. Um, the practice of fair use is a challenge insofar as it, as it is not an exact science. To implement fair use requires an understanding of the basic principles or classes of situation that are defined as the best, pra best practices statement points out, help reconcile copyright law with the First Amendment. Ultimately, the fairness of fair use is determined by lawyers and judges according to a rule of reason. All the facts and circumstances are taken into account to decide if an unlicensed use of copyrighted material generates social or cultural benefits that are greater than the cost it imposes on the copyright holder. The classes of situation that define fair use are one, employing copyrighted material as the object of a social, political, or cultural critique. Direct commentary and parody are both encompassed by this principle. Two, fair use also includes quoting copyrighted works of popular culture to illustrate an argument or point. That is, the work itself does not have to be the object of the critique, but the work quoted may exemplify or illustrate the argument. A third section of, of fair use is the incidental capture principle. Documentarians working in real life situations often record copyrighted materials in their audio or images because this copyrighted content is found everywhere in real life. Examples such as background music playing in a, on a location or a television set tuned into a popular show in a place where someone is, is making film, that would be an example of that. Um, in theory, fair use should protect the documentarian from having to falsify reality by removing or avoiding the recording of any copyrighted materials. Um, so when can a filmmaker invoke fair use? The statutory formulation lists a number of factors, the purpose of the use, the nature of the protected work, the extent of the use, and its in economic impact. Should fair use be contested, courts will consider these factors in deciding whether particular uses qualify. The basic question is always the same, whether the public cultural benefits of the use outweigh the private economic costs that it imposes. In recent decisions, strong preference has been given in fair use analysis to uses that are transformative in character, where a creator has added substantial value of her own to the material that was derived without authorization from pre-existing works. Um, I'm gonna show a quick clip from a, a series that I worked on called With God on Our Side, which was a six hour PBS history of the religious rights engagement with politics in the United States. And during the production, we referred to this uh, this montage as the going to hell in a handbasket sequence because it illustrates the, uh, the things that um, during the 1970s the, as the moral majority was coming up, uh, the kinds of things that they were upset about in popular culture. And so we used a lot of very short, quick examples of popular culture to make this point. And some of these clips were cleared and some of them weren't. So. Preachers were starting a new action by their fear of international communism. Our religion. It has been called an international criminal conspiracy. Certainly, it is more than a social theory, more than a method of political organization or an economic system. It is a directed way of life. It is communism. Emerging from this bottomless pit, the government 
materialism, captivating by a glamorous vision of a regenerate mankind, recruiting the youth by perverting their religious fanaticism, utilizing every modern scientific method. This tyrant is tweaking the earth. I think it's high time religion. He is broke. He is full of tears. It has no answers. And it's up to us. This fellow's name is Francis Schaeffer, and he was in the 70s one of those sort of initial gurus of the religious right, kind of one of its main theoreticians. being squandered by the 60s generation. Now everything is about sex and sensuality. Everything is about feeling good. Everything is about your erogenous zones. Everything is about this world, this moment, this very nanosecond. These are not the cause of our decadence, but a reflection of it. You get these things when a nation turns its back on God, on moral principles, don't teach them at home, don't live them at home, don't teach them in school and reinforce them in the culture. The word family has got to be defined a lot more generously than it has been through, uh, through our recent history. You know, you could even have two lesbians bringing up a, a, a child in a wonderful way. The birth of the world's first so-called test tube baby in England has raised fears that women who don't want to be bothered with carrying a child for nine months may hire other women to do it for them. People said, why do we have these rules about divorce? Why do we have these rules about pornography and so on? Uh, these are just dead customs passed along from by a forebear. We don't know why they existed. What you're saying is the parents really ought to discuss the merits of masturbation with their children. They should. Bring your mind and your ass will follow. Excuse me? It was, and we know when, when we made this series, it was in the mid 90s, and you know, it was kind of, we thought this was all a joke. I mean, it, it seemed like, you know, this was the middle of the Clinton era, and we were, you know, this was all past history, this religious right stuff. Little did we know that <laughs> they were just lying low and they're <laughs> gathering their forces in any event. Um, okay, so as I refer to um, this whole issue of licensing and using clips and, and money has gotten serious because it costs a lot of money to buy footage from, for documentary films. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about why that's the case. Um, Rights cost more because the ownership of material has consolidated over the last decades. Many small archives and picture collections have sold their content to a much smaller number of large corporate owners who, for the most part, are less willing to negotiate based on a filmmaker's vows of poverty or the film's you know, general social or political worthiness. Uh, rights are generally determined by the number of markets in which a film will be distributed and, and the term or length of time that the license will last. And they cost more because filmmakers now often request to purchase a much broader package of rights than they might have 10 years ago. Um, production monies are harder to come by and more and more productions are international co-productions and that necessitates clearing for expanded territories or world distribution. Major studios tend to have language in their contracts, so if you're making something for a major studio or even like HBO, they require the license that you get to cover distribution for all platforms, for instance, and interactor format systems now known or hereafter devised. So what's an archive to do? You know, you have to clear for media that don't even exist at the moment, so. As the technological means of distribution have multiplied, savvy rights holders have distribution add-ons for new markets such as VOD or video on demand, internet streaming, internet download, interactive multimedia, consumer video devices typically defined as video discs, video cassettes, or any form of interactive multimedia for exhibition by means of a playback device. So, <laughs> kind of boggles the mind when you start dealing with purchasing these rights from these um, archives. So, 
Driving the high prices charged by rights owners is also the anxiety that the archives have over losing control of their content. Consequently, any usage such as internet downloading that creates the possibility of an end user being able to duplicate the content is likely to add a huge extra cost. And ironically, the commercial successes, I think I mentioned earlier, of certain documentaries in the past few years from Fahrenheit 9-11 to Capturing the Freedmans has made it more difficult for films that may ultimately command a much smaller audience. The most advantageous rights packages are negotiated for inclusive packages that take all the markets into account up front. Add-ons, that is, adding new distribution markets to a rights package at a later time, costs more and involves time and energy on the part of the filmmaker to renegotiate with a copyright holder. So most filmmakers will attempt to, at the outset to purchase the maximum package that will cover their needs. Um, public domain and access. Public domain footage, or PD, as one archivist said to me recently, our favorite initials, is footage that is not copyrighted by virtue of one of the number of circumstances. Either the footage was shot before 1923, or the copyright was not renewed, or the footage was donated to a public institution, or in the United States, the footage was created by the government, military, or a government agency. Filmmakers who use archival material in their productions are often confused by the fact that frequently they have to pay usage or access fees for material that is technically in the public domain. Uh, the explanation is one of access. For example, a filmmaker may be presented with the choice of going to the National Archives to acquire, for example, footage of the Hollywack, the Hollywood <laughs> HUAC hearings from Universal Newsreel. That same footage can also be purchased from any one of a great number of stock footage houses who over the years have acquired collections of public domain material. The filmmaker who chooses to acquire the material from the National Archives will incur the costs of researching the material, wading through an approval process, arranging and paying for transfer of the footage to broadcast quality copy. Um, but the, and the National Archives has regulations about transfer procedures and the client is obliged to transfer entire films or reels when she may be interested only in a short clip. It is often the case that the same footage can be acquired from a stock footage house who will charge the filmmaker an access fee for providing a broadcast quality copy from its master of public domain material. The economics of that decision depend on the many factors involved in researching and processing the footage through the bureaucracy of the National Archives versus the ease of using a commercial service. Um, and so I'm going to show a short clip, a second clip from the same John Kerry movie because it includes some footage where we had to make that decision. Mid 
assault, and the commander-in-chief turns back on us. I shall not see, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. And I, I let that clip run a little long just because I thought the Tet offensive material was kind of interesting in this particular um, situation that we're dealing with right now in terms of the situation in Iraq and the politics in the country. But um, the, the, the clip of footage that I was actually talking about was the very first clip, which is that uh, beautiful clip of the bombing of the... Uh, of the jungle in Vietnam, which was a clip that our director actually saw in a documentary that Werner Herzog made and insisted that we find this exact clip, even though Werner Herzog couldn't tell us where he got it from. So we had to pay uh, three or four different researchers in Washington to find th this material. And it, it, it took a lot of time. <laughs> but I guess it was worth it because it, it really is a pretty, uh, it's for some reason this particular role of stuff that includes this material isn't cataloged in the usual way in Washington, so we really had to find somebody who knew what we were talking about. But it, uh, it, was, it, was, a, it was a process. In any event, um, just in case any of you came here today because you're interested in getting into this line of work, um, I'll just spend a few minutes going over a little bit about this long career of mine. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I haven't really included anything about sort of the nuts and bolts, like where you find what and how much it costs and all that kind of stuff. And I'm happy to answer any of those kinds of questions that you might have. But my first major uh, research undertaking was as one of the principal archives researchers for the Eyes on the Prize, which is that 14-part uh, television history of the civil rights movement that some of you may have seen. It, um, Working on these programs was my introduction to all of the major network news and newsreel archives. When we began in the mid-80s, nearly all of the archival elements relevant to that story were only on motion picture film, typically uh, 16 millimeter black, black and white reversal with magnetic stripe or optical stripe for sound. Uh, the segments we selected were copied to film because the production was made on film at that time. And that was a much more involved and a more expensive process than today's video-to-video uh, -video duplication. And I was very fortunate to have been able to launch my career on that series because we really dug and we really spent a lot of time. I worked on that for about a year. And I got to work with some great people at uh, Blackside who made the series, and many of them are close associates of mine to this day. And in fact, uh, I guess about two weeks ago, I watched the first two programs, which I had, which are being rebroadcast now. Um, and I think I could still tell you where almost every shot came from in those two, because I don't know, maybe just uh, it was just so amazing to have found all of that footage and to have worked on that in such a focused way. Um, so, and as many of you might know, that. Uh, Eyes on the Prize itself exemplifies one of the things I was talking about because it was out of circulation more or less for the past 10 years. The first series aired in 1986 and the rights were purchased for all of that footage for 10 years. So they ran out in 1996 and nobody was able to broadcast or sell home videos or do anything with the series uh, for that period of time. And it became kind of a cause celeb in the broadcasting and the archives uh, community, and uh, it uh, recently was resolved where some foundations stepped up and, and uh, gave the money to purchase the extensions of the licenses for all the material in the series, and that's why it's, uh, it's been on PBS. Um, and I'll show you a little clip from that. In the 10-year period, in the 1980s, 
1950s and 1960s, America fought a second revolution. It was fought in the summer by black people and white. It was fought in the streets, in churches, in courts, in schools. It was sought to make America be America for all its citizens. These were America's civil rights years. I tend to believe that you are advocating Negroes in New York to fail the national change story. Oh, no, that's not true. I'm advocating that American citizens interested in democracy should stay out of change story. <laughs> segregation and Supreme Court or no Supreme Court, we are going to maintain segregated schools down in Dixie. We're going to be beaten for democracy and you make huge democracy in the street. You beat people. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm being so careful to never face in your shirt and hide your gloves. Go ahead. Archival research has also been my ticket to some exotic places. In the late 1980s and the early days of Glasnost, I accompanied an NBC crew to Moscow as the archives researcher for a documentary on the legacy of Joseph Stalin. I spent a month in the cinema of the Mosfilm Studios selecting scenes from Soviet features and documentaries that had depicted factual and fictional accounts of Stalin's life. In the early 1990s, I did the same thing in Beijing, researching for a film about the post-Mao era of Chinese history. Even though this was only a little more than a decade ago, most of the footage that we obtained for that film in China came from government-produced 35 millimeter documentary films, which we viewed on a flatbed film viewer and tagged sections with small silk threads in the sprocket holes. Um, this is a, a short clip from the uh, NBC Stalin, uh, Doc from the late 80s. Oh, 1990, sorry. One of Stalin's favorite myths was that he was the closest and best disciple of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. In this Stalin inspired feature film about the 1917 revolution, Lenin stands by while a swaggering fictional Stalin gives the orders that start young. Seize the bridges by the Winter Palace. Seize them and hold them. And you, Comrade Benesu, go and take a detachment of soldiers and march on the telephone station. Act decisively. In fact, although Stalin participated in the revolution, he played no significant role in the armed attack. Before his death in 1924, Lenin warned his colleagues against Stalin, another fact that Stalin concealed from the people. In Stalin's version, from the feature film The Oath, he was the most heartfelt mourner, meditating in the snow beside Lenin's favorite park bench, and later in his Kremlin office, receiving the spiritual blessing of the departed leader. Um, fast forward now to research in the digital age. The internet has simultaneously opened up vast quantities of archival footage while shutting down some of the more exotic travel opportunities. Let us say now that our fingers do the walking. Uh, the technological changes along with the budget constraints that I've referenced earlier have changed the landscape for professional researchers. Collections are proliferating, probably due to a general societal acknowledgement of the importance of preserving visual history. And because so much has been preserved and so many documentaries have exhibited so much media that was previously unavailable, producers and directors of documentaries have expectations that often far exceed their budgets. Even experienced producers tend to underestimate the amount of time it takes to do research, never mind the licensing rights and permissions. As the research horizons and the editorial expectations have expanded, 
um, the budget dollars to explore and obtain these resources have hardly been commensurate. When I began doing research, it was typical to work full time for several months or even a year on one project, like Eyes on the Prize or the With God on Our Side which were projects that were of a, about a year's length. But lately, I find myself like a lawyer doling out hours of the day to several projects at once, segueing between US intervention in Latin America, homosexuality in the church, and Italian Americans in the film industry, which are my last three projects. So these are interesting times with reference to the use of archival footage in documentary films. And just to sum up, the contradictory tendencies prevail. Technology brings us m more into our purview while budgetary constraints dictate procedural shortcuts. The success of a small number of films dictates higher prices for the vast majority, most of which will never earn a profit. And as we move deeper and deeper into the information age, questions of private ownership versus public rights and community benefit become critical issues for our times. Many, document, many documentarians in their day-to-day -day practice are taking up the challenge to claim the rights guaranteed to the creative community. As a breed, most documentarians are dedicated and most probably never had illusions of vast compensation for their work. So through their sheer uh, perseverance, lots of interesting footage gets discovered somehow or the other and shown the light of day in lots of new productions. So that's.